I'm writing my dad's story as he told it to me. My dad was born in Newport, Tennessee in 1961. The encounter took place in 1975 on a small dairy farm near Rankin, Tennessee. Dad would have been 14. The farm he lived on had a lake that came up to 100 yards from the back of his house. He would fish with trot lines and gill nets, and his farm had a lot of wildlife. There were deer, squirrels, geese, and ducks. One afternoon, my dad went squirrel hunting with his cousin, Randy. Now, Randy and his friend had a challenge as to who would get the most squirrels that season. Unfortunately, on the day of the hunting trip, his friend couldn't go, so my dad went instead. They walked the farm, but they could not spot any squirrels. For that matter, there wasn't any sign of any other wildlife. They hunted for a couple of hours and saw nothing. When they came up to the gate that entered the farm in the farmhouse, my dad said that it was probably an hour before dusk. They were standing there shooting the bull before going their separate ways, and after talking for maybe 25 minutes, they heard footsteps. Limbs were breaking and leaves were crunching as if something was walking toward them. His cousin Randy said, I bet that's Wally. Now, Wally was Randy's friend who he made squirrel hunting a challenge with. He's probably trying to scare us. My dad was on the side of the gate, which led to his house, and Randy said in a low voice, come on over to this side. Randy said he was going to shoot up in the trees over his head to scare Wally before he tried to scare them. The sound stopped at the fence that was grown up with bushes and My dad and Randy couldn't see through the bushes. Randy shot into the trees above his head at the fence line, and that shot was answered by a huge, loud roar. They knew the sound that they heard was not Wally. Dad described the sound as a loudly rattling, chesty roar. My dad had a Model 14, an automatic Winchester 12-gauge shotgun, and Randy had a 12-gauge, and Dad's gun was fully loaded with the number 5 high-power Magnum. After whatever had screamed, it tried to tear through the fence and shrubbery, and Randy said, uh, that's not Wally. Shoot it! Shoot it! Shoot it! Dad emptied his 12-gauge where the racket was coming from. The small trees were shaking, and Randy's gun was a single shot, and he was shooting and reloading as fast as he could while my dad was reloading. And when my father reloaded, the creature was still trying to get to them. Randy continued reloading and shooting while Dad emptied his gun again in the racket. And then the roaring stopped and my dad loaded his gun once more. Randy said, I'm not going home by myself. I don't know what that was. They loaded their guns and walked back to back for a possible quarter of a mile. There were grown up trees and they kept their eye out on both sides as they walked to Dad's house. Then they got to my dad's house, and dad's parents were at work, and they proceeded to tell dad's older brothers what had just happened. The family members didn't believe a word they said. They told them if they didn't believe them, they would soon find out what it was because it had to be dead. Dark was setting in, and one of my uncles drove Randy home because he wasn't about to walk home alone, and my dad and Randy and my uncle reached the gate. My uncle, one of my father's brothers, said, open the gate. And my father said, no, you open it. My uncle got out and he opened the gate. Randy and my dad began pointing out where they shot at the creature and my uncle took a flashlight. It was dark then and he went over and looked at where they were pointing. My uncles told them that he didn't believe them and he was going to go take a look anyway. He went over to check and he yelled, there ain't nothing here. Randy and my father said, well, there has to be. We shot it over 12 times. They all got out of the vehicle's guns in hand and went over and they saw nothing. The next day, my father and Randy went to investigate for themselves. There was no blood. All they saw were broken limbs and bullet holes and two large spots sunken in the vegetation. They could see leaves and vegetation that had been damaged, but they were amazed that there was no blood. My father never heard of Bigfoot or Dogman at that time. He told me everything he could remember, but one thing he made sure of telling me is whatever that thing was, it wasn't human. 
that is a story I got that uh, Neoma's kind of busy right now and she's not, she doesn't have time to do much editing for me. So this one wasn't edited, so you can kind of see how some of these don't quite gel, but this one did. This one did really, this one came together pretty good. This man from Rankin, Tennessee, back in 1975, they're squirrel hunting. They're out in the woods. They hear something in the woods. They think it's their buddy. They take a shot overhead, over its head to scare this guy. And it wounds up being what they think is a Bigfoot. And then they just laid into it. And uh, there's no body. And that's just, uh, well, I don't get many stories like this. I thought this was pretty interesting. On top of that, I love these stories where people retell their father or their grandfathers or their grandmothers or someone pre the Bigfoot craze would tell a story about some of these creatures that back then would have made them crazy. Now, it's there's so many people who kind of follow this topic that you don't seem crazy, but back then they wouldn't tell anybody they because they would just be laughed at in the uh, in the circles that they ran in. But now that there's so much information about, people have come to the conclusion that maybe there's something going on out there. I think if the whole thing ties in, I can connect it all in my mind, and it makes sense to me. But <laughs> probably what I'm saying doesn't make any sense to you because I'm just rambling. But uh, it makes sense to me, and so I like these stories. Okay, I appreciate the man who sent it. It's very interesting. I love the story. Thank you. All right, this person doesn't say whether I should use their name, so I won't. I'm sorry I say that. Well, I'm not sorry I say that before every story, but I'm just kind of letting you guys know that these are emails I've got as opposed to the I don't know, the one out of 10 where I just tell a story that somebody wrote, you know, that they sent me. If, if I'm just letting you know it's an email, that's all it is. And these are all these people claim these stories to be true. So anyway, they don't give their name. So, or they don't say whether I can, man, I'm confused. I think I'm up too early this morning. They don't say whether I can use their name. So I won't anyway, anyway, here's the story. Uh, it is a woman, I'll tell you that. After high school, I moved to Jackson, where I met Clarence. Clarence was 30 years older than me, but he was such a kind and generous man, and I fell in love with him. We had a son together who was the same age as Clarence's grandson. Now, Clarence loved the outdoors. He wanted to pass that love along to his children and his grandchildren. So when his father decided to sell us 17 acres of land in Markville, Louisiana, we jumped on the opportunity. Besides, the land had been in his family for generations, and it was a place where Clarence could bring his family to experience the outdoors and hunt away from the outside world. Each year, on the opening weekend of deer season, Clarence would take our son and grandson and son-in-law camping on the back part of the land. They weren't just hunting trips, they were family time, a time to bond. The time was special and private, and each day I would ride out on the four-wheeler to cook lunch and supper for the hunters, a task that I enjoyed as much as they loved their hunting. It was a Sunday before Thanksgiving, and I had planned to surprise the boys with a meal of fried quail and gravy. There was something about food cooked in a Dutch oven over an open fire that makes it taste so much better. Well, I got there around 9 a.m. and I put some coffee on to cook. It felt good to be outside on a relatively warm day with the bright sun overhead and very few clouds in the sky. Once I got everything started, I poured myself a cup of coffee and I sat down by the fire and I watched over everything. It was such a beautiful day that I found myself looking around at the woods surrounding me as much as I was watching the food. There was an old deer stand nearby that caught my eye. It was in bad shape as if no one had used it for years. But as I looked at it, I realized there was a hunter in it. The main reason Clarence had bought the land was so that the boys could hunt there and they were safe from other hunters. An opening day of deer season can wipe out a person's good judgment faster than an eraser on a chalkboard, so I was surprised to see a stranger in that stand. I stared across at that hunter, and anger built inside me, and I thought, 
How could Clarence let someone else hunt on our land? He stared back at me through the eyes that were an unnatural red. His face was old and weathered looking, but his hair and beard were still red. He was wearing a plaid shirt and old overalls, and there was something unbelievably creepy about this guy, which only served to increase my anger. I felt so uncomfortable by the man's presence that I was about to abandon my quail and gravy and go back to the house when I heard Clarence and the boys returning to camp. I stood up and I waited for them to approach while keeping my eye on the man in the stand. And then I immediately asked Clarence how he could let a stranger hunt on our land. What are you talking about? He asked, completely dumbfounded by my question. I pointed to the stand where the man had been seconds earlier, but no one was there. There was a man there, I tried to explain. He was right there. He was up in that stand. I was beginning to feel a bit foolish. That stand? Clarence asked. He had doubt in his face. Yes, there was a man right there, I said. I knew what I saw, but Clarence assured me that no one could have been up in that stand. He walked over to it, and he showed me why it was impossible. The entire floor had rotted away long ago. Describe him to me, Clarence said. I told him what the man looked like, and he offered a kind and odd distant smile. I'll explain it later, was his only response. When Clarence got back to the house, he got out an old photo album and he showed me a picture. Was this the man you saw in that deer stand, he asked. I stared down at the photograph of a man with a beard and a plaid shirt and overalls. It was a black and white photo, but he easily could have had red hair. That's him, I exclaimed. Who is he? Well, that's my great-grandfather, he told me. He died in 1929. A Clarence died not long after that, and I moved back to Fulton, where I married again, I suppose out of loneliness. He was an abusive man, so that new marriage didn't last. And then I reconnected with my high school sweetheart and soulmate, and we have a wonderful life together. But for as long as I live, I will never forget the time that I met my first husband's long-dead great-grandfather. That is such a sweet story. That's a great story. And Clarence seems to be a patient, peaceful, kind gentleman, like she explained him. And she saw his long deceased, 1929, died in 1929, great-grandfather. And that's a cool ghost story. There's nothing else I can add to this story. It was just wonderful. Thank you, ma'am, for sending it. I, we, I just loved reading this story. Thank you. Like many kids of my generation, I was 12 years old at the time, my friends and I spent our summers playing in the woods around our houses. Between our family and our neighbor's family, we had over 60 acres to roam and play in rural western, rural western Washington. Rural is such a hard word for me to say. Anyway, sorry to ruin that story. On Friday nights, we would often take our weekly chore money and ride our bikes the four miles into town. We'd buy a pound of ground beef and whichever sugary cereal we could afford. And then we'd ride back to my house and grab a couple of plastic bowls and spoons and milk and make our way back up to the lean-to that we had built in the woods. To us, man, that was living. We built the fire and cooked up some burgers on Mom's oven grate, and then we'd sit back and enjoy the night. We'd listen to the night birds and take turns identifying the various animals scurrying about nearby, and we'd watch the stars overhead. We knew that land as well as we had known our own bedrooms. It was a regular paradise for a couple of young boys, except for that one night. We had eaten our food, and we had, had identified all the animals that we heard, and then we crawled into the lean-to for a good night's sleep. I was on one side and my neighbor was on the other, and our two dogs were sleeping between us. They were the best two dogs a couple of kids our age could ask for, and they loved those nights out under the stars as much as we did. It was the kind of night where sleep comes easy and deep, and if the dogs hadn't started growling, I doubt I would have woken up at all. It was a low, something ain't quite right and you'd better wake up and pay attention kind of growl, 
that a 12-year-old kid hears as the devil is about to step into your camp and we're all going to die. I was too afraid to move, so I laid there motionless and I listened. Thirty feet or so away from us, I could hear the sound of footsteps moving methodically through the leaves. They were walking at a slow pace as if someone was out there trying to be sneaky. Clearly, it was someone on two feet, so I figured it couldn't be a wild animal. Well, that scared me more than anything, and I laid there for a few minutes and listened to the crunching in the forest debris before finally whispering my friend's name. Yeah, he whispered back. Do you hear that? Yeah, he answered. We decided to get out our flashlights and check it out. A flashlight might be an overstatement for what we had. They were those crappy old plastic ever-ready flashlights that required C batteries, and anyone old enough to remember those things will also remember that they were better at letting others, if they're close enough, know that you were there than they were showing the person using them what is out there. Our plan was to sit up on the count of three, turn them on and point them in the direction that the dogs were looking, but by now they were snarling pretty fiercely which only added to our anxiety. Together, we focused on that spot, and we listened to the continued crunching in the leaves. And then I said, One, two, three, and we flipped on the lights, and we couldn't see anything. The footsteps stopped immediately, but we couldn't see anything out there. We flashed the lights all around the woods that surrounded our little camp, but there wasn't anything moving around or even standing still that could have been making the sound. It was several minutes before we gave up looking, and the dog slowly began to settle down and the night fell silent. That was the strangest part. And the dogs acted like whatever was out there had left, but we never heard it or them walk away. That forest floor was covered in leaves and twigs and undergrowth. Nothing could have moved through that without making some kind of noise, but all we heard was nothing. I have remained friends with that kid over the years, but we only spoke about it once. I think we needed to confirm with each other that it really happened. I doubt we'll ever know what was out there, but whatever it was, it had our dogs scared. And to my knowledge, that was the only time either of those dogs was ever afraid of anything. What a great story from his childhood, 12 years old, probably real close to my generation, and that would have been living. We kind of did that stuff. I lived in the city and we would do campouts in our backyard. You know, we'd throw up a tent or something and sleep out there at night. I can't imagine living out in the country and going out in the woods and staying in a tent or a lean-to that we built and then hearing something huge and outside and the dogs growling. That would scare me to death. That's what makes these stories so good. So I appreciate it. It's quite relevant for this channel and I appreciate the man who sent it. Thank you, sir. Here is a story from England. I'm just going to read every word the man writes. This hasn't been edited. He's a pretty good writer. Uh, he says, hey, Cam, I'm a 16-year-old currently living in the northwest of England, and I had an encounter with a creature that was so strange that it resembled a dinosaur. The encounter happened back in December of 2019 when I was with a group of friends in the small village of bolton le -Sans. We all met one day in the hopes of building a bushcraft shelter like the ones you see all over YouTube. And one of my friends at the time, called James, said that he knew a spot that was isolated and hidden, and everything that we could have hoped for. We all agreed to follow him to the unknown location, and after about 20 minutes of walking through the farmer's fields and thin paths, we were met with a barbed wire metal fence and to the left of that on a tree there was a sign that said private, but we ignored the sign and we carefully climbed over the metal fence. After all the boys successfully got over, we looked around for a brief minute to observe the creepy yet somewhat beautiful forest. It was so creepy that some of the trees even looked like tortured souls with faces. Maybe we were all just being paranoid, but we all got similar feelings that we were being watched after about five minutes of walking through the dense woodland, one of my friends said that he had seen movement in the distance. He pointed forward, and to all of our shock, there in plain sight, 
we laid eyes on the strangest, most obscure creature we had ever seen. It looked like it belonged in a science fiction movie. And the best way I could describe the beast is that it looked like the raptors from the Jurassic Park movies. Every single one of us stood in panic as we watched it quickly run into a neighboring tree line. I counted down from five to one, and we all ran backwards toward the fence and climbed over with sheer fear as the creature was chasing after us. We ran with no stopping all the way back to my house, and then we sat down in my living room and discussed what we had seen, and we agreed at the time that the creature looked like some sort of dinosaur. None of my friends believed or even take a recognition of the encounter and all put it down as being natural, possibly a deer or something. I just don't know how they could even mistake that thing for a deer. To be honest, I'm happy I saw what I saw that day because it leads me to finally create the YouTube channel that I run today. Thanks for taking the time to read my encounter, Cam. I appreciate your work and how you help bring these topics to light. And the name of his YouTube channel is I Talk Cryptids. You can just type in I Talk, I Talk, T A L K, Cryptids, C R Y P T I D S. And it, uh, I'm going to look that up. I'm going to look it up, take a look at his channel. This was a very good story. They saw what they think was a, like a velociraptor in the northwest of England. Very good story. I appreciate the man sending it to me, and I'm glad. I hope people just flood to your YouTube channel, brother. Thank you. Now, this is a Bigfoot story that I thought was very intriguing. This person writes, mine is a little different from the ones that I've heard. I was watching a video on YouTube from a channel that people would typically call a conspiracy theory channel, but I find that they really speak the truth most of the time. They did an interview with a man who has regular contact with Bigfoot, UFOs, spirits, or beings from other planets. This man lives in Washington, and he has videos of various beings and ships and lights or orbs in the sky. He talks about how he saw a Bigfoot that looked like it was upset, so he asked if he could help, and it said no, and it teleported away in front of him. It was there and then that it dematerialized right in front of him. His name is James Gillian, and he owns ECETI, Enlightened Contact with Extraterrestrial Intelligence. He has rooms that you can rent to experience this, or you can rent a campground and camp in tents if you want to be outside. So I learned of this place in the summer of 2020, and I wanted to go there. So a year later, when they started giving people the stimulus money, I used mine and I planned a week-long trip from the middle of California to Washington, and I stayed there for three nights. My best friend was with me on this trip, and since we had seen so many of these videos and heard all the things that Bigfoot can do, we already knew that they can hear your thoughts. So for months before my trip, I would ask them telepathically if I could please get a picture with a Bigfoot. And I told them that I was coming all the way there specifically for them and I wanted a picture. I also said that no one would believe it even if I got a picture, so could I please get a picture? We arrived on a Friday afternoon in June. I had been driving all day and I was glad to get there. We rented a tent that comes with a queen-size blow-up mattress big enough for two people, and we lugged all our stuff into the tent and began getting things situated. And then it started to rain. And since the mattress wasn't airing up and they weren't at full capacity, they upgraded us to a room and we moved everything in. It rained a little and it was cloudy as it got dark and there were chairs outside in a field that you can sit in and watch Mount Adams in the sky at night for lights of UFOs. So we all went out there and we watched. Amazingly, lights appeared above the tree line and they blinked and were way up too high for any person to have made them. The distance from us would mean that it would be a very bright light if you were close up to it and it would have been huge. 
It was probably 13 or 14 miles away. We continued to watch until the lights were covered with clouds and it started to rain. I went back to our room and I laid on the bed while my friend mingled with some other guests. I ended up falling asleep while my friend was visiting with the girls next door. The next morning, they told me what happened while I slept. They even had pictures. There was a footprint near the fire pit area. They also saw a spaceship in the sky, and they took a picture of that. And when they zoomed in on the lights on the ship, you could see a light illuminating two windows and four beings standing in front of the windows on the ship. The two beings on the left looked like maybe they were some sort of an insect-type being, maybe like a praying mantis because of the shape of their heads, and the other two looked human. Now, no one can prove this, but I think they took the two girls up on the spaceship so they could take a picture of themselves on the spaceship, and then they brought them back with no memory of it. On Saturdays, you can come just to watch the sky and then leave. A lot more people came to Skywatch and participated in a ceremony to call any beings that want to come through and show themselves. After the ceremony was done, James mentioned a lion being coming through. He said a lion being had never come through before. I'm convinced it came just for me because it's in my picture and I love cats. Well, James can communicate with Bigfoot and ETs telepathically and he can hear what they're saying. And then we all went outside to sky watch. No one could really see much because it was still cloudy and raining. Disappointedly, we went to bed that nothing had happened because it was a cloudy and rainy night. For no reason at all, I woke up at 3 a.m., and I think that's weird because I didn't have to go to the bathroom. I lay there half asleep, and I could hear a really loud bird making a noise while I was trying to sleep. Now, I'm not from Washington, and I'm not a bird expert, so it didn't click yet that what I was hearing was wrong and much too loud for any bird to make, especially since the window was closed and the sound was far away from me. And then I thought, oh, maybe I should go stand in the field and see if anything is happening, and that's why I woke up. So I said in my head, okay, let me get up and I'll go to the bathroom. The bathrooms were a short walk outside of my room in a different building. After going to the bathroom, I walked through the field, and I just stood there, and I thought, okay, here I am. I looked at the sky for a few minutes, and nothing was happening, and meanwhile, the bird was still squawking, and I was standing there not paying much attention. I think he realized that I wasn't getting it, so he switched from a bird noise to a horse noise. I heard what sounded like a horse when they make that sound with their lips flapping together, but it was so much louder than a horse could make, and then I heard a weird bird sound. It was a bird call, but it didn't even sound like a real bird. The sound was much too loud for a real bird to make, and during that time, there were no other animal sounds, no birds, no crickets, no nothing except the Bigfoot making horse and bird sounds. I stood there for 30 minutes listening to the sounds, and I wanted to get closer to the sounds to see if I could see what was making them, but it was so dark that I was worried I might fall in a hole and break my ankle. I walked very slowly toward the sounds, but ended up stopping 150 feet from the area where the sound was coming from, and then I thought, can you just come out and walk across the field? I can't see very well, and I don't want to break my ankle. I heard more horse sounds, but the Bigfoot never came out where I could see him. Thirty minutes went by, and I was cold, and I was getting wet, so I went back to my room, and I tried to go back to sleep. After everyone got up in the morning, I was walking around the field, and I saw the owner watering his garden, so I asked him if there were horses next door. He said no, and that there weren't any horses anywhere near there. And then I told him what happened, and he said, oh yeah, Bigfoot do that all the time. They mimic different animals. And he continued gardening as if nothing amazing had happened. After hearing that, I walked over to the spot where I heard the sounds coming from, and I looked in the field next door. There was no way possible a way a horse could have been there making those sounds. 
There were growing crops in the field next door, so a horse wouldn't be in that field anyway. They even had one of those giant industrial sprinkler systems operating in the field. So once I ruled out the possibility that it was a horse, I knew it had to be Bigfoot. I knew it was when he woke me up to come outside, but I just had to make sure. Later that day, I went to the spot, I heard the sounds, and I left some organic apples. But since I had seen videos about that, I knew these Bigfoot like organic food and peanut butter and banana sandwiches. So people would bring jars of peanut butter or crystals and leave them for Bigfoot in an area just for them. There were other spots to leave gifts for other beings. Bigfoot needs salt and iron because they live in cold weather. Salt is like antifreeze, which is why they put it on the roads. So if you live in a cold climate, put out blocks of salt, mineral blocks, unless you want them to kill your animals and suck out their blood. Blood is very salty and contains iron, which is what Bigfoot need to survive in cold weather. Anyway, the next morning was our last, and we had to leave by 11 a.m. So I went and I checked to see if my apples were gone, and they were, but I don't know if it was a deer who ate them or a Bigfoot. I suspect a deer ate them, but I at least thought of them and brought them food. We ate, and we packed up, and we left and headed out of Washington and into Oregon. We had the whole day to be in Oregon, so we decided to stop at Watson Falls. Since it was cloudy and raining for most of the time we were in Washington, we didn't get any good pictures, and none of them were at night, that you could be able to see the orbs, so we ended up taking a lot of pictures of Watson Falls. We parked and we hiked up to the top of the falls, it was so beautiful and peaceful with the water running down the stream. We got to a really good spot where there was a large rock in front of the stream. So I had my friend take pictures of me on the rock. She took several pictures of me with my camera. All along the path to the falls, we stopped at pretty spots and took pictures. We started heading back because I wanted to get back on the road before sunset. The stream from the falls ran all the way down to close to where we parked, so I went in the woods and had a drink of water. It was the best tasting water I'd ever had. We left and we went home, and I didn't look at the pictures in detail until my friend came over two weeks later. We both showed each other our pictures, and that's when I discovered the amazing things. There are a couple of pictures that are amazing. And since the trip didn't go as we expected because of the clouds and rain, I didn't get my picture of Bigfoot when we were in Washington. Instead, I got the most amazing spiritual picture of Bigfoot and a lion being. They did the best they could under the circumstances, and they gave me an even better picture than I could have imagined. While I was looking at this picture, I asked what the Bigfoot's name was, and I heard him say, George but I didn't think he looked like a George. I think that's what James calls him. I made a video about it, and I posted a short version of this story on my YouTube channel with the picture. Just search the word vacation, and you'll find it. Best vacation ever. Fuzzy Tiger Cat is my YouTube name. You can call me Sun or Fuzzy Tiger Cat, you guys really should go to E-C-E-T-I if you can. But make sure you go for three days to maximize having a good experience. I'm going back next year. Okay, that was a good story. Uh, it had not been edited, so it was a little bit... It kind of jumped around a little bit. I had trouble kind of following along with what was happening. But it was a good story all the same. And f so here's what you need to do. If you want to dig more into this person's story, look up Fuzzy Tiger Cat. That's all one word, F-U-Z-Z-Y-T-I-G-R-C-A-T on YouTube. Uh, then add to that best vacation ever. And that video should be somewhere in your list in your search. And you can watch that. Tell her that I read her story on YouTube and that I suggested you guys go check her out and uh, check out these pictures that she has. I haven't seen them. I might look it up this afternoon when I'm finished recording, but this is very interesting. This person really wanted to have an experience with Bigfoot. She believes that you can communicate with them telepathically. 
And she was begging them all the way there to please let me get a picture of you. And they didn't come through, but they did in Oregon. So it's a great story. Thank you very much for sending it, ma'am. All right, that's going to wind this podcast up. Thank you guys for listening. And we'll see you on the next one. Appreciate you.